So, this is my story of what happened to me and my friend Anne. Her name has been changed to protect her identity, and mine will be redacted to protect mine. In 2017, I was an airborne school graduate. I had, however, broken my leg the first week. I didn't know that I had. I just thought it was bruised. Well, that's a story from another time, though. So after graduation, I was set up to go down the road to the 75th RTB to start RASP, Ranger Assessment and Selection Program, formerly RIP. I could hardly walk the day after graduation, so I went to the TMC, that's the Troop Medical Center, where they gave me a five-month profile to heal and left me stuck as a holdover in a Co-1502 PIR. During this depressing time, I learned my unique shamming skills, and I also met a girl. Now, before any other paratroops who were listening to this start to think, no, it was not airborne Jessica. Although I did almost fall in that trap. But my friend stopped me and reminded me that she was not a myth, and she was trying to get to me. I'm sorry to the folks reading this who don't know what I'm talking about, but, well, just be glad. The girl I met was named Anne. She and I hit it off phenomenally. I spent almost every weekend in her apartment located in Auburn, Alabama. Most of the black hats didn't care about the holdover guys and let us get away with most of the stuff they found out about, although we were pretty good at hiding our shady business. Anyway, I've always loved ghost stories, well, movies, and pretty much anything else that deals with the paranormal. I've visited many haunted places and have stories of them if anyone wants to hear them. Now, whenever I visit a haunted place, I like to go in without a bias and just see what happens. If there is an odd event, I'll do everything I can to explain it rationally. Only after exhausting every idea will I start to think, well, it's paranormal. I told Anne a few of my stories and made her watch many movies that she'd never seen. Anne had grown up Pentecostal, so she wasn't allowed to watch non-Christian shows, movies, and couldn't listen to anything but country or Christian. I'm proud to say I introduced her to classic rock and soul. Well, she knew I loved to visit rumoured haunted locations, so she told me about her own experience on Smedley Road. The story of Smedley Road sounded like a very typical small-town ghost story. Rumours of witches living in the woods, and personally I don't believe in witchcraft. Well, there is a, also a story of a family who died in the late 1800s from TB or some other rampant disease. The whole family had perished, and was set to be buried in a small cemetery down the lonely, seldom used road. Each member was laid to rest in this cemetery, except one. A man and his wife with their son had been buried together, but some mistake left their younger daughter to be buried elsewhere. The story goes that... You can find this cemetery on a long, narrow, overgrown and unmarked road, and you park your vehicle and turn it off. The family of the lost child will search it for her, and will not let you go before they've finished their search. Then, and only then, will you be able to start your car and leave. Of course, that intrigued me. I've never experienced such a phenomenon. Now, this was the story Anne told me. I texted her to have her tell me it again so I could be accurate, and she gave me permission to tell this story, but I'll also change the name she used. Well, when we were in high school, me and my cousin Janet wanted to go down this haunted road, so we called up Jack, Trin, and Steve to see if they wanted to take us because Jack knew the way. They agreed, and Janet brought her boyfriend, Fred. We met and left from Jack's house in Jack's old single-cab Ford truck. Jack, Trin, and Steve were in the front seats of the truck, and me, Janet, and Fred were in the bed. When we started down the actual road, I kept seeing red lights following us through the woods on my side. I turned my head to get Janet's attention, but when she looked, they weren't there. All of a sudden, Fred yelled, What the hell? We both looked to the other side, where he was, and there they were, matching our speed, but deep in the woods. After they disappeared behind a group of trees, we never saw them again. We pulled up to the cemetery and all got out. We walked around a bit, but got a really bad and creepy feeling, so we started to leave. Once loaded up in the truck, well, the damn thing wouldn't start. 
Jack kept trying and trying the engine, but it wouldn't start. We were all freaking out. After what felt like an hour, but was probably only five minutes, the truck roared back to life and we pulled out of there so fast I thought we were going to lose the tires. Now, how could I resist going there after that story? After much persuasion, she agreed to show me the way. The next day, we left about 1pm. I wanted to get a good idea of the route and see it in the day. The road was indeed hard to find and the cemetery was tiny and full of old beer cans from, I'm guessing, the 70s. You know, the beefy pull tab cans. There were two sections, one lower than the other towards the back wood line. As soon as I walked down and stepped foot on the lower plane, I felt a dreadful feeling. All these graves had been desecrated. Brass nameplates ripped off the tombstones, and the others pushed over and broken. There were graves that looked like they'd been dug out. Before someone says that the casket probably collapsed and that caused it, that's not what these were. I know what a collapsed casket grave looks like, just a dip in the ground. These were several feet deep, like the casket had been removed and the hole was filled in. They were full of weeds and overgrown grass. Well, I snapped some pictures and left. Anne was waiting in the car. She wouldn't step foot into this cemetery. I figured that this place was like many others, and rumours were just rumours, and nothing paranormal would happen, and that Jack and Steve had messed with the whole group years ago. Well, I was very wrong. We came back about 3am, leaving our apartment at 2. The road was pitch black. Even the LED lights I'd recently installed in her car on Bright only cut about ten feet into the darkness. The road, full of sharp and sudden turns, made me go slow. Nothing looked the same in the dark as it did in the day. I would have driven past if Anne hadn't grabbed my arm to tell me to stop. She'd gotten a bad gut feeling that it was near. And sure enough, after using my phone's flashlight to look, it was right beside us to our right. I'd already looked at this spot when it was in front of us and hadn't seen anything, but now I could see the tombstones. The air felt noticeably cooler coming through our window than it had been on the drive over, especially for a hot, humid Alabama night. The slight breeze carried the smell of dirt and nature. I lit a cigarette and started to walk when Anne called me back and asked for one. Now, Anne has never smoked but she took it with shaking hands, leaning out her window. I lit it because she was shaking so bad she couldn't do it herself. I didn't get why. I felt fine. No bad feelings, and I didn't feel creeped out or scared. I walked around a bit at the upper part, still no indication of anything even slightly paranormal. I walked towards the back and walked down the slope. Almost immediately... I felt an overwhelming feeling of dread, like I was being watched intently. Like someone was shooting daggers into my back. To be honest, it felt like the time I was being stalked by a mountain lion with a co-counselor in the hill country of Texas when I was a camp counselor. Or the look my mother gave me when I was a kid and used her expensive crystal wine glass for juice and then shattered it. It was an uncomfortable silence. No animals or insects making noise. It was deafening, and I was trying my best to remain calm while every instinct was yelling at me to run. Then, some snapping twigs and crunching leaves broke the silence. I was thinking it was a deer, but I couldn't see it in the woods. It sounded like it was only a few feet in front of me. Shining my light around, I spotted a weird shadow. It almost looked like someone peeking out from behind a large tree trunk. Half a head, connected to half a torso, with a shoulder and an arm. I figured it was just my light casting it from some leaves or a bush or something. It was at this point Anne yelled for me, saying we needed to leave now. I could hear the terror and urgency in her voice. I took one last look at this shadow and saw it dart behind the tree. I wasn't moving the light at all when that happened. I got the hell out of Dodge and took off, sprinting, scrambling and tripping. 
all the briar and dewberry catching my pant legs as I ran blindly back up towards Anne and the car. I almost broke my ankle when I fell into one of those dugout graves. I picked myself up and got up the hill. This time the bad feeling did not leave me as it had done earlier in the day. I jammed the keys in the ignition and tried to start it. It was just clicking, like the battery had died. I'd forgotten about the whole car won't start part of the story. I was thinking that Anne had killed it by leaving the interior lights on. I was about to open the door to check the battery connection when Anne grabbed the key and started to turn it. I only remember the story when I saw the tears of terror streaming down her moonlit face. I squeezed her hand tightly and tried to reassure her. I tried one last time. The car started right up like nothing had happened. I put it in drive and turned left as sharp as I could. I had to do a three-point turn because of how narrow the road was. When I put it in reverse and backed up to the edge of the cemetery, I could see the red hue of the tail lights. Pitch black torso and head were inches from the car. I couldn't see any features on it. The high went from naught to sixty in seconds, driving dangerously fast with poor visibility. Every so often, I could see him in the woods on the edge of the road, between trees or on the random patches of tall grass when I slowed for a sharp turn. I saw him illuminated again in our taillights a few feet behind us, in the middle of the road. Anne didn't see him. She had her face buried in my arm, sobbing. She then jerked up and asked me a question, which, well, I just wish she hadn't. Do you hear that? I told her no because I truly didn't hear anything but the rocks crunching under the tires and my own heart beating in my ears. She physically pulled me over into her lap, causing me to hit the brakes at least we crash. My head almost out her window, I heard it. The sound of a woman wailing and screaming deep into the thick woods. My eyes lit up with fear and I asked her, what the fuck is that? I quickly got back seated, and I could now hear it from my side of the woods as well as hers. Again, I pushed the pedal as far to the floor as it would go. Still periodically seeing the shadow man and constantly hearing the noises even miles down the road. As soon as the car touched the dirt road that adjoined Smedley and led to Hardball, everything stopped. The sound. The shadow man. The horrible feeling and the terror. We drove back to her apartment in silence that was only broken by muffled sobs coming from my tear-soaked arm. Later, we talked about what had happened, and she told me that when I was down by the back of the cemetery, she couldn't see me or my light, and she could hear tapping on the rear window glass. The tapping moved to the back driver's side door, and then to my door like someone was tapping on the car as they were walking around it. That's why she was yelling at me to come back. It didn't stop until I got up to the slope and almost to the car. That night, she shook me awake, because she had a nightmare about a large, menacing shadow man walking up behind me in the woods. I then told her about the stalking shadow man that I'd met that night. I hadn't told her about him because I didn't want her to freak out even more. Well, I guess he told her for me. I will never go to Smedley Road again. I know that Shadow Man has not forgotten me. He lets me know in the occasional terrifying dreams I have about him stalking Anne. Nor will I ever forget that he let us leave that road once. I don't think he'll show me that kindness a second time. I've only told a few people this story and only went a few bottles into the night. You don't have to believe me. I don't care. Just please don't try to find Smedley Road.
Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you.